us join then in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do cling to that old rugged cross because we know that that is the way of salvation. We know that he died for us, that he paid the penalty for our sin. And, uh, but then he rose again. And because he lives, we too shall live. This is our faith. It's very simple, Father, but that's the way you intend it to be. We ask for your blessing upon our service here this morning, and we ask it in our Savior's name. Amen. Okay, the lesson for today is found in the uh, first chapter of John. John chapter 1, beginning at verse 29. And this is, uh, it's about John the Baptist. It says the next day he, that refers to John the Baptist. So I'll just say that. The next day John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, <clears throat> behold, <clears throat> the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came, baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit, John said, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb, of God. Heavenly Father, I pray now that you would impart your holy word through my words and the meditations of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Why did John the Baptist refer to Jesus as the Lamb of God. You know, in the New Testament, Jesus referred to himself as the Good Shepherd. Uh, in the Gospel of John, Jesus is referred to in the very first chapter as the Word. He is the Word become flesh. There are different ways of speaking about Jesus in the New Testament and in uh, theology as we think about the message of the gospel. We can think of Jesus as we often do. He's our Savior, right? He's our Redeemer. He's our Rescuer. Or, in a few moments, we're going to sing... What a, f no, Jesus loves me. But there's what a friend. We, we were trying to decide between the two. What a friend. We can think of Jesus as our friend. We think of him as our good shepherd. We are the sheep of his flock. So there's all kinds of different ways that we think about Jesus, the Son of God. But uh, John, when he was speaking, see there were other people there. Some of his, it says some of his disciples. He had his own followers. 
And so when he saw Jesus coming, walking, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. So again, why did he use that expression? That's the first thing that we want to think about today. He used that way of describing Jesus because he knew that the people of his time would understand what he was saying. Do you see? Because he was undoubtedly speaking to Jewish people. Now later on, Paul especially did a, quite a lot of preaching to non-Jewish people. They were called Gentiles. But John the Baptist, he was speaking to people of his own uh, ethnic heritage. They were Jewish people. Now remember, John was the son of Elizabeth. Right? And remember the time, I've, oh, I've always loved this one. Mary, it says Mary went to the hill country to visit her cousin, Elizabeth. Remember that? It's beautiful. So Mary goes to see Elizabeth, and when Elizabeth sees Mary coming up the walk, the baby in her womb leaps. Remember that? Elizabeth was carrying John the Baptist, and Mary was carrying Jesus. It's a beautiful passage. But this was within the context of the Jewish faith. Mary was Jewish. Elizabeth was Jewish. Uh, Jesus, his heritage, his human heritage was Jewish. So, that's why John the Baptist used the words, Lamb of God. Because in the Jewish religion, there was a lot of emphasis on sacrifice. Right? If you go to the New, I mean to the Old Testament, I think there are 630 laws. Or is it 613? 640? 30. 630. Okay. She's a pastor. So I always check and see. <laughs> I thought it was 6:30, although I I, I haven't counted them for a couple days. <laughs> it's full of laws, ceremonial laws, dietary laws, uh, moral, ethnic laws, laws on everything, and a lot of those laws have to do with sacrifice. Uh, and so in the Jewish religion, they would sacrifice lambs. And I think also pigeons. Remember when Jesus went into the temple on what we call Palm Sunday? Remember? He's, he comes to Jerusalem. One of the first things he does on that Sunday when he came there. Now he's going to be crucified the following Friday. But on that Sunday, he's just come in to be welcomed. By all the big, uh, you know, the people, blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord, blessed is the son of David. We'll, get, we'll go through that again on Palm Sunday. But then on Monday, the next day, he goes into the temple and he's angry. And he tips over the tables because there were people in the temple selling stuff. And one of the things they were selling uh, they were, I think, pigeons. They were selling things that could be used for the purpose of sacrifice. Oh, he didn't like that. That's, stop this. Well, that's why, be, but that was later. That's, but now, at the beginning of his ministry, you, they're just starting to call the disciples, and John the Baptist refers to his cousin, Jesus, he says, Behold the Lamb of God. He knew that the people to whom he was speaking would understand what he was saying. That's very important for a preacher. Yeah, a, a, a sermon like I'm giving now, a sermon is not a lecture. When I was in seminary, oh, 
<laughs> we used to have lectures, and some of these seminary professors, I remember one in uh, several, I mean, they were great, but some of the lectures were so uh, difficult, you really had to concentrate to understand what the world they were saying. They were talking about one of my favorite areas was called systematic theology. And that's sort of related to philosophy, and I really like that, but boy, it's not always easy to follow. And, uh, but then, sometime, when there came time for the professors to preach at the service, we had chapel every day in seminary, and there was one professor, oh, I can remember it like it was yesterday, almost 50 years ago, and this one professor, he was not only really good at lecturing, he was a great teacher, but he was an even greater preacher. One of the few, most of the lecturers weren't that great preachers, but he was terrific. His name was, well, if you use the full term, it was the Reverend Dr. Paul Sonic. Oh, he was great. And you know what we called him in seminary? We called him the Sonic Boom. <laughs> Because he preached, like I do sometimes, you know, I mean, it's not, you're not too confused about what I'm saying, right? All right. It's so important that the people understand. This is what the people understood, and this is what we know in our hearts. Jesus was the Lamb of God. He is the total and final sacrifice for the sin of the world. This is what we believe. We all sin in thought, word, and deed. We all fall short of the glory of God. We look back at our lives. Do you have any regrets? Of course. Oh, I look, I look back in my life and I think of some of the things that I did. I think of some of the things that I said. I think of some of the thoughts that I thought, and oh, I have regrets. One of my, just to give you an example, one of my regrets, and I will live with it as long as I live because there's nothing to do about it. The past is, after all, the past. One of my regrets is that I wasn't as good a father as I should have been. I wasn't as good a father as my dad was. And part of it was it was just different. My dad was a dairy farmer. And my dad and I, from the time I was 14 or 13 up to 18, when I had to go away to college, which I didn't want to do, I did the junior college. I could stay home and take care of my cows. Oh, I said, oh, you got to finish the last, so I did. And then I had to leave home, and I never did get back. <clears throat> but my dad and I were very close. He was a great father. And we milked those cows every morning and every night. We spent a lot of time together. And he is the greatest influence in my life, my dad. But I look back to my own life, you know, I could have been a better father. You know one of the things I didn't do, which if I had it to do over, I would have tried to do? I didn't spend enough time with my sons. I had two boys. The oldest will be 50 this year. And the youngest will be 48. Oh, they're wonderful boys. They're wonderful sons. They're just great. But I didn't spend enough time with them. Why? You know why. Because of my calling, but not just that. I can't just say, well, after all, you know, I was called to be a minister, and you have to. That is true, but I wouldn't, I'm a kind of workaholic. Some of you are too, so don't look down your noses. <laughs> I've kind of brought up, you know, work, work. I mean, if you, if one of your parishioners needs you, you better be there. And but, I mean, I could have tempered things a little more. I could have. I know I could have. 
Well, there's nothing I can do about that. I can't go back to when our boys were six and eight. You can't either. So I have regrets. And I have regrets, you know, we all do. There was something we did way back, long time ago. Something we did, and it's still in our minds. We wish we hadn't done it. But it, it, it happened. Okay. The point is that we have forgiveness. We're not going to get what we deserve. I've often said the last thing I want is what I got coming to me. <laughs> right? Mm -mm. All I want is what I got coming to me. I don't. <laughs> I don't deserve everlasting life. Not in a billion years. I don't deserve it. But Jesus was the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. That means he, takes, he took my sin away. He died on that old rugged cross for me. That's why we all love to sing it. It's one of the all-time favorite hymns. I will cling to that old rugged cross. Yes. The Lamb of God. Now, <clears throat> what that does when we, and we have to keep telling ourselves this. Have you discovered that? You have to keep telling yourself that Jesus loves you and he died for you and because of him you're going to go to heaven when you die. You've got to keep telling yourself that every single day. Why? Because the devil, he is always sneaking around. Oh, yes. Mm. And he doesn't like you. He doesn't. He hates you. And he hates me, too. He hates preachers that preach the gospel. There's nothing he'd like better than to get rid of every single one of us here. But he's sneaking around, and he's trying to say, it's not really true. Here's what you got to do. He's doing it. He doesn't want you to have the peace that surpasses, surpasses all understanding. He doesn't want you to have that peace. He doesn't want you to have that serenity. He wants you to be worried. He wants you to be upset. He wants you to, to oh, just to be fussing and, oh, what have I, you know, what have I got to do and when have I done enough of what I got to do? That's what he wants. And sometimes he makes a little progress. Uh -huh. He gets you worried. That's why it's important to read your Bible. And it's important to come to church. And it's important, in other words, for every one of us to be reminded every day that our salvation is not about what we got to do or when we've done enough of what we got to do. Our salvation is about Jesus on the cross who taketh away the sin of the world. He paid the price for my sin. He took my place. He died for me. And so that when I believe in Him, I shall have everlasting life. For God so... Here it is. I mean, it's not complicated. But the devil, that he tries to make it complicated. I've talked about in the past, some of you have heard me preach for a number of years, I talk about yeah, but theology. Yeah, but theology. We're justified by grace through faith. Yeah, but. Well, yeah, but you gotta. That's not, I've called it yeah, but you gotta. I should write a book. Yeah, but you gotta. <laughs> and even within the church. Within the church, that's been done since the beginning of the church, hasn't it? We're justified by grace through faith. Yeah, but you got to uh, write out a check. 
and we realize in our hearts that Jesus is our Savior, then, you know, and it's gotten better. The devil is losing when it comes to me. He's losing. He's a loser. <laughs> and I don't take any credit for it. It's not, it's not because I'm so strong. It's because the power of the Holy Spirit has enabled me to grow in my simple childlike faith. And that is the same with every one of you. You've been growing in your faith for a long time. And so now as we're closer to the end of the journey, we can have that serenity and peace that this world cannot provide. I know that my Redeemer lives. And I know that because He lives, I'm going to live. There's no doubt in my mind anymore. There used to be more doubts. I knew how I got my not, not much of that anymore. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful to be maybe what, you know, maybe we're in the autumn or maybe the winter of life? All that means is we're getting closer to eternal life. Now, it doesn't mean that we just sit around, oh, well, maybe it'll be tomorrow. No, what it means to me, and I know what it means to every one of you. Here's what I'll say. What it means to me is I'm free. And so the question, the most important question that I have, it's not formal, I mean, it's not as, you know, you know what I mean. The question I have is, well, gee, what do I get to do today? A lot of people say, boy, you sure, you know, you sure work hard. You do a lot of things, you know, running to the hospital, like I said today, I'll make, and so on and so forth. But it's not about that. It was about that more when I was younger. But now it's not so much about, oh, I need to do this. And, but I mean, it's, a, it's a, you still do it, but it's with a different attitude. See what I'm saying? What do I get to do today? I had a... I had a service yesterday for a lady that I had been bringing communion, a memorial service. I had been bringing her communion for 16 years. She called our Savior's Lutheran Church where I was before. One day she called and uh, the secretary answered the phone and she said, is there a minister there that could bring me communion? So the secretary put me, put her through to me, and I said, hello, and she said, I, I'm wondering if, she's, well, she said, are you a minister? And I said, yes. She said, could you bring me communion? And I said, yes, I said. Well, she said, I belong to a church where the minister won't bring me communion. He will send over lay people with communion. Sometimes called lay Eucharistic ministers, which are very helpful. I mean, they're great. But this lady said, and I don't want a layman, I want a minister. <laughs> and she was that way. I mean, she was, she believed what she believed. So I said, okay, I'll come. And that happened about 16 years ago. I went every month. And uh, she turned 90 last June, and here about uh, four or five weeks ago, no, 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 about three, two weeks ago she died. <clears throat> so I had her memorial service. She'll be buried up in Bellevue, Washington. I'm from Washington, so she was a teacher up there before she retired. Her husband is buried up there. She'll be buried up there. But you see, my attitude now is what do I, not, you know, what do I got to do? 
It's not, oh, no, 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 no. It's, what do I get to do today? Huh? It's really, no, what do I get to, well, I get to go, I ask my wife, she still calls, you know, she makes some of my call people ahead <clears throat> to set up the time. This week, for example, I get to go and see Vern. Oh, what a guy. He'll be 90 in May. Vern Nelson. Man, you talk about a saint. He wouldn't like it if he knew what I was saying. He doesn't watch it on the TV, so that's okay. But it's what we get to do. You, because of Jesus, are on the way to glory. And I don't want you to forget it. I want you to know it in the depths of your being. When you die, your body's going back to the earth, but your soul is going to be taken up into the heavenly realm, and you're going to be given a new body, not because you earned it, not because you deserve it, but because Jesus was the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. He took your sin away. He took mine away. Doesn't mean we don't sin and fall short. We continue to do that. But He continues to forgive. One of these days, don't help me. You're going to see the Lord face to face, and he's going to say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter now into the kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of the world. Now, if that doesn't happen, you come back and tell me about it. <laughs> you come back. You were wrong. <laughs> It's going to happen. That's why you're all smiling. Amen. Okay. Now.